Our next and uh, keynote speech uh, is going to be from two of uh, from the family who are some among our most long-standing members. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the stage Mark and Harry Westwood. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Westwood, and this is Harry. <laughs> Eighteen years ago, we knew nothing about Aniridia, uh, but we've learnt quickly. And our journey has been quite interesting. We thought it would be useful to put this year's annual conference in context by sharing the story of our journey with you, noting that it's a very personal story. It's unique to us. It was a product of our circumstances and of its time. And I thought that by exploring some of the experiences that we had, it might uh, enable some of the conversations later on today to be put into context or you might identify issues that are relevant to yourself. But I suppose our journey starts with some background. We're a Navy family. We've moved around the country an awful lot. Uh, and I have worked away from home much of the time. So that has meant that Andrea has been left as a single parent to deal with uh, Anaridia. When Harry was born, we were living in the Lake District. We'd been there for about nine months. We had no family nearby, no close friends there, uh, and no real community links either. We moved to Helensborough, west of Glasgow, within three weeks of Harry being born. So what little support that Andrea had had in the Lake District, we lost. We were now 400 miles away from our friends and our family, and we had no links to the community, and I was about to go to sea. And so I think it's worth reiterating again, and it's sort of part of the, uh, of the mission here, that this is a unique journey to us. I'm not suggesting that we have any answers, but if we do have experiences that are relevant to you, I hope that uh, you'll find them useful. Now, for some weeks after Harry was born, we were unaware that there was anything wrong. Andrea had had a vague idea that he wasn't focusing enough, but not sufficient to raise any real worries. But at the eight-week checkup, our family doctor had concerns, and Harry was referred to the Glasgow Children's Hospital. And it was there that Anna Ridia was diagnosed. It's worth noting that there was no previous occurrence of Anna Ridia in the family, so we knew nothing of it. The explanation of the condition was clinical, cold, and almost callous. It was a blunt diagnosis with very little reassurance. It was very matter of fact. It was very upsetting. We thought about it for, for quite some time after this and we realised that actually the medical profession didn't have the answers we wanted at this stage. We weren't interested in the genetics, we weren't interested in what had caused it. What we really wanted to know was what did it mean to us as a family uh, and for Harry as he was growing up, and we just could not find that information. Of course, we did our own research. Even then, the internet was publicly available and had been for about two or three years. Google didn't exist, but AltaVista did. So in my wisdom, I put Aniridia into AltaVista, and I scared myself witless with what I found. The information was not helpful. It was contradictory. Uh, it worried us, it talked about kidney tumours, developmental problems, it talked about a lot of stuff that was not relevant to how we were going to grow up. But it scared us, and it really panicked us in the early stages. What we really needed was to find somebody who could talk to us about the condition. But it took a while to find it. There was no Facebook or Twitter or social networking. Anaridia UK hadn't been invented at that stage, although there was a small organisation that was starting to uh, be available. And after a wee while, we discovered Yvonne Booth, who was down, lived down in Plymouth, and she and her family had a history of Anaridia. And she was the first person that we had spoken to, and she was able to give us some reassurance that actually it wasn't all gloom and doom. And we were very grateful. There is a pressing need for reassurance in the early stages. Medical information is not useful to, newborn, to parents of newborns, to some extent it is. But the buddy scheme and talking to people with, uh, with the um, uh, aniridia is really quite important. 
And I suppose that really brings me to my second observation, is that we felt very isolated and very alone. But as mentioned, all our journeys are different. Just to remind you of the context, I was away, we'd moved into a new area. Andrea had to deal with a toddler and a newborn with a rare medical condition that we didn't really understand. So Andrea sought as much support as she could find, baby and toddler groups, National Childbirth Trust and the Navy's family community support. And I think my third observation is that in these early stages there is no substitute for reliable support, both emotionally and practically, whether it be friends or family or support groups or, as we've already heard this morning, buddy schemes. Of course, Harry was then subjected to the barrage of tests on a six-monthly basis. We didn't think these were very well coordinated, blood pressure, ultrasounds, glaucoma, under anaesthetic initially, then by the dreaded pen, and later by the puff of air. And each time we felt that the family was being treated like objects on a conveyor belt. There was a job to be done, and we'd just be pushed through it. The experience again left Andrea angry and upset, and some of the tests seemed puzzling. Nurses would come along with eye drops to dilate Harry's pupils, and we asked, why are we doing this when Harry's got no irises? And we never got a satisfactory answer. I still get asked that, I, that my daughter still gets the drops, and I still ask that question, and I still don't get an answer. We, we, we can have a <laughs> chat later, then there, there is a, a, a reason apparently. And Harry was also given eyesight tests using pictures with which he was not familiar. Now, those of us who are re relatively old will recognise that this is a train, or an engine if you're going to be technical. Harry had never seen these, he'd never played with uh, Thomas the Tank Engine, and had no clue. The closest that Harry could come was, it's a boot. <laughs> and he was shown a picture of a telephone. Well, even 18 years ago, we did <laughs> not use tele telephones like that. We were on to cordless and the first set of mobiles. And so it was totally inappropriate, the, the tasks that Harry was being given to do. And this didn't help our confidence in the medical profession. Blood samples were taken, and they took over a year to get the results, because the research funding had dropped out, and it took them a wee while to find further funding for the research that they were doing. And we realised, after a couple of years, that our journey was going to be chaotic and uncoordinated more often than not. And there wasn't necessarily a standard way of doing things. We had to start working it out for ourselves. So my fourth observation is we might just as well accept that this journey is going to be chaotic, confusing. So keep notes. Write down what happens to you, what the professionals tell you. Keep a diary or a log. That way you can present it and you can talk to the next guy who comes along with different ideas and present him with at least or her with what's happened previously. We then started to notice that Harry was developing differently. He had different behaviour compared to his elder brother. And we suspected, inevitably, that some of this was related to aniridia. Harry hated animals, especially pets. They creep up on him and make him jump even cats. Dogs particularly had to be locked away when we visited. He was terrified of them. Partly because of the surprise element of creeping up on them, but also because of their barks. Harry was very, very sensitive to loud noises. He disliked dogs barking, balloons popping, fireworks. And one of the routines that we had to adopt was to wait until we went in, before going into the cinema auditorium, until all the advertisements and all the trailers, and more importantly, the rank gone, had finished before we went in and sat down to watch a film. Not surprisingly, he was sensitive to light. He cried and cried outside, and hated bright supermarkets, until we discovered big hats and children's sunglasses. Interestingly, when he was a baby, he slept much better on his tummy, and so we let him. Even now, he still uses a sleep mask. But, to our relief, we slowly came to understand that, in most respects, Harry was a normal, happy toddler. He was marginally slower to walk than his elder brother, but then he did have a very fast crawl, so there was no need to get up. 
But a significant difference was that he was very, very slow to start reading for his own pleasure. And to a large extent, he still doesn't like reading. But audio books and listening to stories are still one of Harry's enjoyments. So I think the fifth observation here is that ev because everybody's journey is different, you will become the expert on your journey with Anaridia. You'll understand how it affects you and your family and what their needs are as a result. Now after three to four years we still didn't really understand how best to treat Harry's eyesight with spectacles. Although he had prescription lenses he really needed sunglasses too and it was hard to find a good optician that really understood the condition and was interested in anything other than just the strength of lenses. Eventually a specialist was recommended. He was 90 minutes drive away but well worthwhile. It was a huge relief to find someone who really knew what was needed to treat aniridia. Importantly for us, he considered the family as a whole and had toys available that would keep Sam amused whilst Andrew and I could sit in and listen without being distracted to everything he had to say. In our first 45 minutes with him, he had done as many tests and more as had been done on Harry in the previous three years. We talked about the types of lenses and the accuracy of eye tests. We discussed different colours of tint for lenses and how to get lenses that dark with brighter light and how they could pre-tint those lenses in their workshop on site to enable them to have a tint even whilst they're indoors in dark. We tested for 3D vision having already been told that Harry would never see in 3D. Well, that turned out to be wrong. But importantly, we were told about the NHS entitlements and how to go about filling in the myriad paperwork that was necessary to ensure that we could get the spectacles we wanted at a price that involved little cost to ourselves. Now about this time, we started to think about nursery and preschool. But I think uh, we need to cover the observation that you've got to seek friendly professionals and get recommendations for them. We were then concerned about leaving Harry with specialists and people who didn't know anything of his condition and who didn't understand what aniridia would mean for him because by that stage we knew that we were the experts. We also knew that the teachers wouldn't find the information that we wanted them to know by looking in textbooks. So we came up with a simple information sheet, the My Name is Harry, that explained what his condition was, and more importantly for his carers, how aniridia would affect everything he did. And by writing down everything we knew, Andrea and I discovered that each of us had spotted different things about his behaviour and what he was doing. And this was surprising, but it did help us better understand his condition. And even as an aside, as we were reading through this presentation last night, we were still discovering that there were things that one or other of us knew that we'd never shared before in the, in the last 18 years. Which probably tells us much about how much we talk to one another. <laughs> this explained the unusual behaviours such as being uncertain on checkered floors, so a black white tiled floor he would stop at, and rather than go over it he would prefer to go round. He used shadows to find the edges of steps and walls, and when he was uncertain he would drop to the floor for his own safety. Andrea noted that he was a nightmare on rains. He'd want to run and explore and get close to things. And he had no real appreciation of danger. High slides and huge climbing frames posed no fear, partly because he didn't really understand how high up he was. But after several iterations, this knowledge and related observations, combined with Harry's input, and written from Harry's perspective, became what we called the pupil's passport. So my seventh observation is write down what you know. Printed notes help teachers and carers remember. It helps them share information among themselves. And it helps us to check the details of what we understood about Harry's condition. And this was important to provide some continuity approach particularly if teachers or the specialists change. Now, at one stage, we had three separate visual impairment teachers in three years, and typically they would change annually. 
But I think I've said enough eventually. And it's about the time that Harry joined in and gave his perspective. Of course, no sooner had we settled Harry into primary school than it was time to move the family again. And so in 2003, when Harry was seven, we moved south to the Forest of Dean, not far away from where we are now, just over the River Severn in Gloucestershire. We found that this was a very different care regime. There was no joined up support as we had in Scotland, and Gloucestershire seemed very fragmented. Again, we found ourselves with no family close by, no friends, and the native community that we had come to rely on wasn't, well, just wasn't there. Education and medical records took ages to be transferred from Scotland, and we were starting from scratch, but by now we were battle hardened. At preschool and nursery, I don't really remember much of what fazed me or what affected me, partly because I can't really remember any of it, but also because I don't really, didn't really know that I was any different from anyone else. I still don't think that I'm any different realistically. The first thing that I really remember that I can link back to Aniridia, even though I don't, didn't really realise the connection until several years afterwards, was that in year one, I was trying to be involved in a task where there was some cards to be looked at laid on the ground. I naturally picked one up because there was no chance of me being able to see what was on them whilst they were lying on the ground. But I was told off for this because it was considered snatching, and I didn't, but I didn't know what I'd done wrong. At nursery, I discovered that I was quite clumsy when walking, or in my case, running about without a care in the world. This subsequently led to me running into various unlucky people and other more solid objects. <laughs> I have a distinct memory of running into a small wall, smacking my head in it, and bringing my head back up with only half the number of lenses that I had to begin with in my glasses. Well, I guess it was about this time that I ran volunteered to become a parent's rep for Anaridia UK and volunteered to become a trustee and a, a member of the, of the um, uh, committee. It was an opportunity for me to share what little experience we had gained with new parents who were also experiencing the fear of the unknown. Our local village school was small, 60 to 70 pupils, with each teacher covering two years. So we revised the pupil's passport, updating it with new knowledge and the changes that we'd noticed in Harry's behaviour at school. We turned the pupil's passport from a leaflet into a booklet. And so my eighth observation is that things do keep changing all the time. Keep the passport relevant and tailor it for your circumstances. Even at this stage, Harry was able to correct our mistakes and he helped us get the passport right for his condition. We expanded each of the sections, taking the four main conditions that we felt affected, Harry, aniridia, nystagmus, glaucoma and stereoscopy for 3D vision, and said what that meant for Harry's uh, behaviour and how he would cope. We also covered the vision aids that we felt were, were necessary for Harry and some of his coping strategies. We also talked about the extra support that Harry had in Scotland and that he'd need uh, in primary school. And we added a little bit on the back, uh, an introduction to genetics and anatomy that would help teachers understand what Amaridia was about. Now importantly though, we wrote the booklet in language that reflected Harry's age and maturity. We also found a plastic model <coughs> of an eyeball whether you can see it, I'm not sure. We found it in some science museum or te technological centre somewhere. And that was quite useful to go around and help teachers understand exactly what the problem was with that video. Fortunately, the school was very good. They took notice of the problems and made adjustments. They painted lines on the edges of steps and fitted blinds to windows. And when Harry started school, he understood his condition and was very kind to write it up in a diagram. And if you can't read it, it says where the arrow is pointing, that place is called the iris. Some people have an iris, and some people don't, like me, Harry Westwood. Thank you. <laughs> Within six months, it was clear that Harry's self-esteem had taken a huge knock. He was struggling at primary school, and we were getting very upset about it. It didn't take us long to realise that if we wanted something to change, we needed to do something, and quickly. We called a meeting with the school. 
Fortunately, the head teacher and the deputy were willing to listen and to help us. Now, by this time, Harry was eight and was a key member of that review. He was very aware of what was wrong and how things could be changed to help. We reviewed everything that we could think about, and it turned out to be a learning session for us all. We considered Harry's position when he was working, making sure that he had his back to the light, and making sure that blinds were closed on sunny days. We made sure that he was close to things that needed to be seen, whether that be pictures or screens. And to reduce neck and backache, we found a sloping board for him to bring the books closer to him. And when films were being shown at school, he would sit at the teacher's laptop and look at that, rather than sitting right up close to the, sc the screen, as he does with the television at home. We experimented with the best colours of whiteboard paint, and we found that either black or purple were the best. Some of the others were just rubbish. Touch typing lessons were started. Initially, the intent was to use a laptop in primary school, but this never really happened. Uh, but it was a useful skill that he took forward to secondary school. But most importantly, we pushed for a statement of educational needs because we wanted one to be in place before his SAT started. And by working out which are the most useful aids for Harry in school, we discovered that a monocular was important so that he could see things clearly, a sloping board to bring the books closer to him, and an F-grade pencil, and that's between a B and HB, which was just right for him to be able to see his own handwriting. So my ninth observation is that you've got to keep monitoring for problems and get in early. Review the successes and keep doing them. Look at the failures and see what um, uh, has to be changed. And while a statement really helped us and has seen Harry through his uh, schooling, I understand it's not clear how those sort of needs will be met in the future with a contract between the pupil and the school. And Harry played a full part in his primary school, and it's a story that's better that it's told from Harry's perspective. Whilst in the early years of primary school, I never considered myself less able and got on with things as a child does in primary school. Later on in primary school, I noticed that my hand-eye coordination and my balance were poor. I decided to work on this by practicing bouncing a tennis ball and tennis racket. I did this until I was satisfied that I was good enough at it. I didn't really do anything to improve my balance, that just came, seemed to come over time. I enjoyed being involved in sports and doing things with other people, which is why I joined the choir, football club and nature quiz team. I started learning the guitar but quickly gave it up because I couldn't see the frets, so it was frustrating to play. I then started learning to play the piano, which was a lot easier because there is a lot more contrast between the keys. Outside school, I joined the local scout group as a beaver scout when I was six, which was a very good way of being able to interact with people, doing adventurous activities in a controlled environment. My greatest accomplishment in primary school was getting the role of Joseph in the school's production of Joseph's Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. That built my confidence up a lot and encouraged me to try for bigger parts in school activities. For example, the following year, I went for the role of prosecutor in a mock court case carried out between different primary schools. Whilst playing sports at primary school, a constant challenge was me versus the sun. It was, all, it, was, it was almost impossible to have a play while facing into the sun. I would always request to have the side of the court with my back to the sun whilst playing tennis or would ask for my team to play with our backs to the sun in other sports like netball, where cap definitely helped though. I enjoyed cricket, but it was always quite difficult just by its nature of being fast-paced and well-spaced out across the field. I became proficient over on bowler with some practice. Batting was a little harder, but at primary school level there isn't much over on bowling, which means that I had a decent enough time to react. Fielding was the main issue because at a distance the cricket ball doesn't really have a colour, it's just dark, so it's impossible to see where it has been hit unless it has gone above the skyline until it's contrasting with the sky. This means that most of the time it's impossible to judge where the ball has gone until it has pretty much passed me. <laughs> After a while, though, I learned how to judge the ball's trajectory by the batter's movements which I was sort of able to discern. I never had any problems with bullying at primary school. There was only gentle teasing that happens between all children. Having glasses, though, was a feature that was identified to be part of the teasing, but it was not because of aniridia. 
Well, the benefit of being in a small school was that Harry could participate in most activities, although even at the end of the first year there, the head teacher asked, would he like to participate in sports day? And we were astonished. Harry would have been mortified not to have got stuck in and compete with others. And it was the first time that we realised that even with our pupils' passport and talking to teachers, we still needed to manage other people's expectations about what Harry could do and what he would want to do. We realised that we might need to push harder to give him equal opportunities and prompt people to set high expectations. And I ended up becoming involved in the local scout group as a result to help Harry with his scouting. Here was an environment in scouting that gave excitement without danger, uh, adventure without hazard and courted more risks than schools could really cope with. And the prospect of camping and playing with fires soon drew me in and I ended up running the local scout group as a result. And unfortunately that meant that I had to step down from being a trustee for Anoridia UK as I couldn't juggle everything that was going on in my life. Meanwhile, we had been working hard with the school to make sure Harry wasn't disadvantaged unnecessarily. He had developed good listening skills and on the whole was confident to speak up when things weren't right. And Andrea and I, a bit premature, Andrea and I had built a good relationship with the school as we suspected that it would be easier to get changes if the school trusted us and knew us. Both of us were on the Parents' Association for some while. Andrea became a classroom helper, then a governor, and then a teaching assistant, and the school paid for her training. Andrea also established a close relationship with Harry's teaching assistant to make sure that any issues were understood and, and, and any problems addressed promptly. And that leads to the tenth observation. You can help your school to help you. Be prepared to work with your school. Good relationships are really important when the going gets tough. And we found that our schools found it easier to respond to suggestions rather than having to work things out for themselves. And we spent a lot of time seeking opportunities for informal chats, which was probably easier because it was such a small school. But the informal chats really helped when it came to the formal discussions of difficulties. Eventually it became time to move from primary school to secondary school, and there were some key differences. He was in a school of 70 pupils. Now he was going to go to 1,000 pupils. So Harry would be anonymous initially. And instead of one teacher for every two years, it was going to be 10 teachers in every year. So it would take loads of time for each teacher to get to know Harry's condition and what it meant for him. And instead of a static classroom with lessons being taught in the same place throughout the day, Harry was going to be moving around school for each of the lessons, so there were mo mobility and access issues to consider. There were new subjects, and there were many more practical lessons. To overcome some of these issues, we explored the school before he joined. There was a week of orientation with other new pupils, and a thorough mobility assessment was completed. Luckily, the teaching assistant moved at the same time. Andrea rather sneakily asked the new school if there was a vacancy for a TA and one was created. We updated the pupils' passports, including a now more thorough understanding of successes and shortfalls in a schooling environment. But it was tough. You need to keep persevering. Things change and it takes time to get things right in a big school. Take plenty of time to manage the transition and don't underestimate the effort needed before and after. But I think Harry can do the secondary school issues. When I went to secondary school, I was originally concerned about getting about and finding my way around school. But after I'd completed the first timetable cycle, I had settled in and everything was fine. I started to get involved in things like sign language club, the choir, and I started taking singing lessons. It was in secondary school when I was in the, when I was 11. That's your seven that I started to appreciate that I was different enough, such that it meant that I had to do things differently to stay at the same level of attainment as other students in the classes. And I spent a bit of time coming to terms with this because I didn't feel that it was fair, but I realised I could do as well, if not better, if I played to my strengths. It was also in Year 7 that I had to do a short speech on a subject of my choice, and I thought it would be good to do it on Aniridia because it has an emotional effect on my life 
and it would also allow me to educate other students about the condition. My tutor thought that, it was, that if it was recorded, it could be shown to my teachers to show them what aniridia is like for me. Unfortunately, nothing came of this. The largest frustration that occurred during secondary school was getting work enlarged. No matter how much we as a family reminded my teachers to get work enlarged before lessons, it hardly ever happened. If they didn't enlarge it, then I would struggle, but if they went to enlarge it in the middle of the lesson, I felt guilty for in impacting the on the learning of the other students. To be honest, some teachers were better than others. Later on, it was decided that the easiest way of dealing with this issue was for my teachers to use my teaching assistant to get any work enlarged for me. I also had issues with ICT, that's information communication and technology because I had to use one of the school's computers. The issue comes because the wires were arranged so that there was no ability to move them on to closer because it was always too far away. When I asked, they did supply me with a computer at the front of the class which had a monitor with a long enough wire so that I could put it right in front of me. But this was only in one classroom and in one place. If I had to use a computer in any other room, um, in any other lesson, I was still unable to move the monitor. When I used the library computers during break time and lunch time, I used to stand and then lean on the desk in order to see, which didn't mean I stood out quite a bit, and thus had to constantly explain my behaviour to people, which was nice on the occasion when people seemed interested in aniridia. Another issue related to ICT was trying to follow instructions that were shown on the interactive whiteboard. Even with my monocular, it was difficult to see the cursor because, because it is very small with little contrast and hard to see even whilst at the front of the class. This was sorted out in my second to last year by having a piece of software that meant the image on the teacher's computer was shown on my computer, but again, this was only on one computer. My le worst lessons were DT, that's design technology, and art, because I really struggled with the hands-on aspect of them. This also goes with practicals and science. Both art and DT required the kinds of manual dexterity and precision that I never needed to do before, and so would fall quite some way behind the projects. These were the only two lessons I felt I really needed to have a teaching assistant's help. Science practicals were hard because the measuring equipment wasn't accessible with Aniridia. For example, the graduations on measuring cylinders are hard to see, and especially on my nemesis titrators. I got through most of it by relying on the, the person I was working with and actually did very little work myself in practicals, which really didn't do me any favours. It also didn't help that I never really understood what was going on in demonstrations because I couldn't see them well enough. At the start of secondary school in Year 7, I started using a school laptop to type up lessons that required writing. One of the most annoying things about the laptop, though, was that it took about 30 minutes to log on to the school's network and the wireless connection was so bad that there were usually only three or four places in the class that had access. Fortunately, in year nine, I traded that, that laptop in for one that my advisory teacher had got money for. This one couldn't access the school's network, but was still a massive help because it was able, it was much faster and had a much bigger screen, which was useful as I didn't have to strain my eyes as much, but was heavier and took up much more space in my school bag. Also, because it belonged to me, I could take it home, but because my desktop computer at home had a bigger screen and was on a lever arm that was wall-mounted, so I could bring it so that it was only inches from my face. When using the laptop, I chose not to use expen the expensive software that was purchased, which could change all sorts of settings, but preferred to use the magnifier that comes from Microsoft, because it was more convenient and less fiddly. It was around year 9 that I stopped using a sloping board because it just became a hassle to cart it about and decided I could manage without it. Also, around this time, I decided to stop wearing a cap because I decided it detracted from my coolness. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that really helped build my confidence was attending scouts, because as I grew older, I'd been given responsibility as a patrol leader in clubs, and I'd also learned various skills that made me feel more confident. With my improved confidence, I decided to join a group in school to do the Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award. DV itself was really good and a fun experience. I was already quite comfortable with the camping because of scouts, 
So it was quite relaxing. It was one of the first decent social experiences that I'd ever had with my friends outside of school. As secondary school progressed, I slowly grew more accustomed to being with people and enjoyed socialising with them. Although this was still only within school, it helped build my confidence some more. I managed to control the environment in which I socialised in school by becoming a student librarian. This was good because it gave me some new experiences and allowed me to meet new people. I wasn't very social outside secondary school because I find being in new places nerve-wracking and being constantly on edge to not lose my friends was the thing that put me off most about hanging out with my friends. I also felt that I'd be a burden on people who would have to watch out for me. I'd still think that's a problem, although not so much now. This is probably the aspect of my life that I feel has been most affected by aniridia and bothers me the most because I feel like a bit of an outsider because I don't feel I've experienced people enough to know them and how to respond to them. As a result, I feel slightly like a hermit at times, although I enjoy my own company, but therefore I do feel quite introverted. A social issue that occurred in lessons was when people were allowed to sit where they wanted. Everyone would immediately move away from the front. It is much easier to be mischievous the further away you are from the teacher. Um, which meant that I was usually left on my own because I'd have to stay at the front of the class to be able to access the lesson. This didn't happen all the time because I had some close friends who were kind enough to help me with accessing the lesson. One of the things that I felt was important to learn, but that I don't think I did learn at secondary school, was that people seldom refuse to help you if you ask them to help. I feel that asking for help when I'm struggling is in some way me being selfish. In year 10, which was my first year of GCSEs, wasn't too bad because I felt I had been given enough time in exams because my statement allowed me to have 25% extra time in all subjects. The same goes for my second year of GCSEs in year 11. One of my defining moments of secondary school was when in P in year 11, one of my teachers came up to me and said, you look so calm out there, I completely forgot about your condition, which was quite a reality check that I was able to fit in well and truly that acknowledgement from someone else that my aniridia was not always defining me, who I am, made me feel really good. From our perspective, in secondary school, we had much less of a link with Harry's teachers, at least compared to primary. So Andrea strengthened her link with, the t with Harry's teaching assistant, and they agreed to meet up every Friday after school had finished. This meant that they could review that week's issues, monitor Harry's progress, and suggest improvements if any issues had arisen that week. They could also make sure that they were correctly prepared for the week ahead. There was one aspect in secondary school that really annoyed us though. Harry was not allowed to play rugby. Although some schools will allow sports goggles, his was not one of them. And we thought that with all the running around and knocking into people that he'd done from a very early age, rugby would have been spot on. And it was pre preventing him from doing what he really wanted to do. Now after Harry's GCSEs, he had to leave that secondary school. It didn't have a sixth form, so he had to work on transition yet again. And this one was a bit more difficult, because which sixth form he went to depended on his results. So we ended up having to prepare, sorry, having to prepare for two sixth forms, one local to us, and the other one some way away in Gloucester. It was all a little bit last minute, but Harry's results were good enough to get him into the sixth form in Gloucester. And they didn't have much experience of pupils joining the sixth form who had special needs. And I still haven't worked out what the sharpshooter's doing up on the top of the roof. <laughs> Gloucester's 18 miles from our house, so Harry has to use the school bus to get there. Now it's a more compact site, with only 600 pupils, and we sat down with a special educational needs coordinator and explored some of the issues. But by now, Harry was more than capable of taking the bulk of, the ma of managing the transition, so I'll let him do that story. This transition from secondary school to sixth form went a lot more smoothly than my transfer from primary to secondary school. Firstly, because my brother had been there, so I felt more comfortable there. Secondly, I requested to look around the school before joining. I filmed the routes, that, all the routes that I'd ever need to use to get from the bus to anywhere in school. So I was able to review this footage over and over to get a grasp of how to navigate around. 
I was quite concerned about getting the right buses, but I just followed those people that I knew were going where I wanted to go, and so that no longer became an issue. I continued to use a laptop for a time in sixth form, but I have now virtually stopped using it because my lessons have so many numbers and calculations that it was just too slow to use a laptop for. This is certainly a relief to my back because carrying both my laptop and all my books was taking its toll. In sixth form, I had more issues with practical experiments and because A-level chemistry involves more individual practicals, I had to be more hands-on. I worked with the teachers to improve access to the equipment such as getting pipettes marked with 0.5 cm3 markings as this is the most frequently required and taping some paper behind a titrator so that it had good contrasting colours. Fortunately, the electronic scales that they had had large enough displays and the school purchased an electronic thermometer which is much better than the regular ones. Some of the textbooks were also found online in electronic form which made it much easier to work out of them as I could enlarge them to my heart's content. I get longer time with, a with my AS exams. At the moment I have 100% extra time in physics, maths and chemistry and 50% in psychology and general studies. In sixth form I started to become more social. I had a much more stable group of friends and started to meet with them outside of school. We've met up and walked around Gloucester City Centre and went to the cinema a number of times. I discovered that rather surprisingly I enjoyed the whole experience and I felt that, I was, that it was quite a big breakthrough for me because I realised it wasn't a tenth as bad as I had been expecting for the previous ten years. I've been very social within the last year. I've gotten over many of my previous fears of getting lost, mostly by planning before going out by using Google Street View, for example, to become more familiar with the environment that we'll visit and checking bus or train times to plan for when the group is out. Well, that pretty much brings our journey to an end. There are still many issues that we haven't covered or touched on. But the question that I think we've not really asked is, Harry, what do you think about having Amaridia? I've got to sit down again. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel that Amaridia holds me back because as it makes things that are straightforward, difficult and time-consuming, I believe it has impeded on my social life because I've had to be more conscientious when it comes to mobility and finding my way around. Intellectually, that I feel that I have been held back because I cannot read for extended periods, therefore I cannot take in information easily from reading or be able to enjoy reading for pleasure. Having my head throbbing isn't what I consider relaxing. However, I feel like it has made me more understanding of the circumstances of other people and so has made me more empathic. I don't really think about anaridia very often and just get on with things. From time to time, I do feel concerned about the possible ramifications that having an iridium may cause me in the future. It doesn't bother me that much as I don't really feel that there is much that can go wrong. I do frequently have to evaluate how I'm going to have to deal with stuff like mobility again because of having an iridium, and I worry about those things, but I feel I would have to be concerned about them anyway regardless of having an iridium or not. I can feel frustrated that because of how uncommon an iridium is, why I should get it, especially when it doesn't run in the family, but I like to consider it a fun challenge when I think about it. I tend to not to feel hard done by it because I like to think I would have been a me meaner, ruder and less understanding person without Anaridia. <laughs> Although I do think 60% of this is just me trying to humour myself. <laughs> I feel that I've accomplished many things. I've played the main part in the school play in primary school. I was the captain of our netball team. I was one of the two people to be selected as prefect for two years at secondary school. I was a school librarian for two years and then the head student librarian. I took part in the English Speaking Union competition and got all the way to the district final and I achieved my Bronze Duke of Edinburgh Award last year. For one of my proudest achievements is teaching myself to juggle five balls, three rings and four clubs, although not at the same time. <laughs> not yet anyway. <laughs> my aspirations for the next five years are to start being social on a regular basis, to do a course in physics and astrophysics and then go on to do a master's degree, hopefully at Birmingham University. And so, to summarise, Harry's done much more than we ever dared imagine and achieved much more than we really expected 18 years ago. And in supporting him, Andrea and I have joined in with the school and with community activities and we've supported Anaridia UK, things that perhaps we might not have done under different circumstances. 
And as we look forward with excitement and not some trepidation at the prospect of Harry leaving our care, going to university and dealing with his aniridia and the issues with other people by himself, I guess that we conclude that for us, our final observation is that aniridia is what you make of it. It provides challenges and opportunities. For us, it's not been the end of the world. And on balance, I think we're probably much richer for it. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? And I think one of the people I really would like to thank is Andrea. explained aniridia to um, other children, but I've never really talked about what um, has helped me. I usually just got on with things and let them observe me, I guess. Yeah, and, and I think it probably. Yeah, it, it probably reflects the fact that schools are quite busy, and with a thousand pupil school, things got lost in the noise yeah. with it. Uh, and that, it, it kind of harks back to the comment that um, occasionally you've got to tell schools what to do because they're not necessarily good at thinking about it for themselves, and they, but they'll welcome those suggestions. So.
Ya. But, but again, I think it comes down to things being lost in the noise when they're busy people. Any other questions? Let's show our appreciation for Mark and Harry. Thank you very much.